Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to this week's edition of uh, COVID-19 with Glenn Grossman. Uh, I am Rebecca Berman. I am the moderator of this evening's event. And thank you to everybody who has sent in questions during the week. Glenn has a, an exhaustive list of questions to go through tonight, but certainly if you have questions that come up during our conversation, please send it to me privately via the chat and I'll try my best to work it into the conversation. If not, Glenn will circle around with answers to your questions next week. So as we know, Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn served as an epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and at UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology projects with Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military Health Service, the CDC, and other programs in the United States and abroad. He currently is Senior Director of Outcomes Research and Epidemiology at Novartis, but all views expressed today are his own. So Glenn, since we've been together, how are things looking around the country and abroad? Give us a quick snapshot. Hey, Rebecca, welcome back. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, so things are continuing to, to get worse uh, in this country. Let me share my screen. Oops. So here we go. All right, so, um, so here we are in the United States. This is the nationwide view. Luckily, the testing has gone up. So we continue to increase our testing, which is great. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're, we're getting more cases. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, increasing testing does not mean increased cases. You know that the tests were increasing and yet we saw a dramatic drop when the cases went down. Um, but, but now we're seeing uh, the highest level that we've seen so far uh, in the United States. Um, and so basically when you look at the hospitalization, which begins to become more important, hospitalization and death rate become important, but hospitalization is at least as important as deaths because a lot of people who are hospitalized have long-term consequences to the hospitalization. They have long-term symptoms and requires rehabilitation that could last months or maybe even years, uh, depending on what their symptoms were in the hospital. Um, and so the, the hospitalization is, is really important also. Um, and what we're finding is we are uh, in the thick of the third surge. Um, this surge is gonna be the worst of them all um, for a variety of reasons. The biggest one is we've entered typical traditional cold and flu season. And what happens during the reason, one of the reasons that cold and flu season is cold and flu season is that respiratory viruses are much more contagious. The, the way we react, we tend to spend more time indoors. We tend to, um, the, the humidity level drop, uh, levels drop. For a variety of reasons, viruses tend to become more contagious uh, and SARS-CoV-2 in particular has become more contagious. Um, and so because it's easier to spread, that also means um, because the, the dose of the virus at the time of infection impacts the severity of the disease, because if you have a certain amount of virus in your body, then your, your immune system has to respond to get to that height to respond. Whereas if you have a smaller amount, then it doesn't have to respond as much to, to deal with all the virus. So the higher the first uh, in, initial infection, the, um, the, the more of the challenge it is for, for people and the, the more severe the symptoms. Um, you see, we've just barely begun this third surge um, and already the hospitalization rate is, is climbing really high. We're at, over 75% when you, so here's zero, we're at like over 75% of where we are, we're at the peak uh, of this, of the first and second surges. Again, the difference between the first surge and the second surge is this is currently hospitalized that we're looking at and the length of stay in the hospital was longer during the first surges for, mo for most people. And so as a result, uh, the people in the hospital during the second surge were in there for, for much less time. And so the currently hospitalized, you might have someone who might've been in here at this point, 
but then they're no longer in here um, at this point uh, um, and because they there's uh, a lower length of stay. Where someone in the hospital here might have continued to be in the hospital for for many days afterwards, and so there were, so this volume, the patient volume, was actually higher during this period, and the length of stay has dropped even since the summer. So that means the length of stay is likely to be even smaller. But we're but we're likely to have a lot more patients as we get the the peaks, um, and so it's it's going to be tough. Another thing is the infection fatality rate dropped a lot for a variety of reasons. Um, the three main ones were that the, the people who got sick over the summer tended to have uh, less uh, uh, risk of having severe disease. They tended to be younger, et cetera. Um, our, our therapies improved. So even just giving oxygen earlier and, and just basic therapeutics the, in terms of the way patients were managed in the hospital, um, that improved a lot and that was responsible for some of the decline. Um, and then the third thing was the, um, the, the summer in terms of how contagious it was and, and, and things associated with that. So now, so now the death rate you can see is already starting to climb back up. Even though the hospitalization rate has just been like this for uh, two or three weeks, we're starting to see the, the, uh, the fatality rate climb a little bit. When you look regionally, <clears throat> and I've talked about this in previous weeks, um, you see that everywhere across the country, it's starting to climb. Um, most states are climbing more. Uh, a lot of states have, have their, hit their peaks earlier, uh, but we're, but we're uh, seeing widespread growth again uh, across the country. And one of the big differences is that previously the peaks hit different parts of the country at different times. And so it averaged out to make it seem like it was smaller, but now everything is starting to peak at the same time across all the regions. And so it's all additive. And that's why very quickly, if, if the regions, if each region, I mean, so you can see Midwest is already far, this is, this is its biggest surge so far, but if the other regions like the South and the Northeast reach the peaks that they had er, at, uh, earlier in the year, which is very likely, then the add addition of all of the regions at that peak level is going to be large, uh, much larger than we've seen before here. Um, and so this is the United States. I'll get into a little bit more details um, as we go, let me, let, there's a couple other things I'll, I'll just point out here. Um, so you can see at a glance, the dark red is where um, the majority of the, the cases are exceeding over 300 per million. And so, uh, so this, this area of the country is, is being hit really hard right now. Um, Kansas and, and Louisiana, they're just not reporting. I don't know what's going on there. Um, but you see that the, the numbers are rising. So for instance, if we look at New Jersey where I reside, um, I don't know if you can see, but we've hit a, a peak back in April or so, 485, just slightly over 400. Um, so between 400 and 500 um, was our peak back then. And now, then, then we got our numbers very low during most of the year, but now we're starting to rise again. And now we're, we're hitting around 200 and still increasing. Um, and so for instance, when you look at the reproductive number, this is how contagious it is, how much it's spreading. Um, you can see that in almost all states, it's spreading. In some states, it's spreading more aggressively. And as, as we proceed through the, the um, winter months, um, it's going to get harder. Um, to, things that influence this are, of course, um, testing and tracing has a huge impact at reducing this. If you can pull people out uh, because you've tested them and, and tested all their contacts who, they, who might have infected them or, or who they might have gotten sick, then you can prevent the spread of, the, of, the, of those chains. And so then that lowers the, the reproductive value. Other things that lower it, of course, are the, the three main things we talk about, wearing a mask, physical distancing, being outdoors. Um, those, those are the, 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 the three things that I see as most important, the things that we can do as individuals, as opposed to contact uh, uh, tracing and testing, which is something that, wrote, that a pub only a public health system and infrastructure can do. Um, and, and we have largely failed uh, in the United States. I don't know if I have pulled out, um, no, I haven't pulled out, have I? No, this is, all right, so no. But basically, um, I'll, I'll keep it at that. Let me look at globally some of the things that are going on. So here's a map worldwide. You can see that Europe is getting hit really hard right now. Um, they, they, they were doing so well for a while but now, uh, but now they're getting hit pretty hard. Um, France, Germany have already shut down. 
Other countries are now considering it. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly which countries are about to shut down. I know there was a question that came in during the week about Slovakia, so I have an answer for them. Uh, and, or I've, I've looked into some of the details about them, um, but, but Europe is getting hit really hard. This is typical cold and flu season. Um, luckily, we're not being hit very hard this year with flu because the, the, the precautions that we're taking against SARS-CoV-2 are also helpful against flu. Um, and then let's also look at the, um, the United States, how we compare. We're continuing to not do very well. Africa has mostly been spared from this epidemic. Uh, there's a, a bunch of hypotheses as to why this is. The biggest one is, is uh, almost certainly simply the fact that this virus hits older people the worst. So people over the age of 75, 80 are the ones to be hit the, the, the most from this virus. And in Africa, the average life expectancy is much less uh, than in much of the rest of the world. And so if you don't have very many 65 year olds or 70 year olds living in Africa because the life expectancy is lower, um, then you're not gonna have as many deaths associated with the, virus, with the virus. There's other things going on. That's not the only reason why Africa is being spared. Um, we can go into this another week. It's really interesting, some of the hypotheses. Um, some, some things have been studied to try to figure it out, but we'll, we'll go into it a different week. Um, the summer, hemis the, the summer um, when it was so summer in the Northern hemisphere, it was winter in the Southern hemisphere. And so you can still see some remnants of, of how hard the, uh, the, the Southern hemisphere was hit over their uh, winter. Um, and so let's see, let's, let's jump into the questions because we have some really interesting questions this week. Um, but, but yeah, this, the, the key takeaway, the United States is really in trouble in the coming weeks. Uh, you might've heard Fauci say that um, we, we've, uh, he didn't use the word failed, but, but we are not going in the right direction. He was very clear uh, that our policies have not uh, that have not been sufficient, and we're not heading into the winter season uh, at all in the right direction in terms of the growth of our disease, of our spread of, of the virus. Um, and Europe and much of the northern hemisphere, we're we're struggling, and it's it's only going to get worse unless we do drastic measures. So many countries are going to have to shut down. We're going to have to increase contact tracing and testing. We're going to have to enforce mandatory mask wearing and, and the other things that we've discussed. All right, back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Glenn, for taking us around the country and around the world. Well, why, don't, why don't we start with the question that came in regarding Slovakia? And Slovakia's outbreak is completely out of control from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And the question that came in is um, about testing. Apparently their government has announced that they will conduct universal testing. Will that help? Ideally, is this something that we could do here? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. So here is a picture. Um, so here you can see Europe. This was Europe's original curve. The testing rate was very poor. So we, we, didn't, it, we can't really look at this curve. For our testing, I tend to tell people <clears throat> because the testing rates have changed a little bit. And so there's gonna be false positives and stuff in there. Our tests are very accurate if you compare it week by week. So the current week versus the last week versus the last week. But if you compare it like three months away or six months away or more, then you can't really compare the, the numbers we're seeing here with the numbers we saw back in March or April, uh, just because the, the, the numbers, it, you can't really, the diagnosis rates were so poor back then. Um, so, but if you compare, for instance, uh, the numbers here versus the increase here, then you can see directionally there was an increase. And then you can see directionally there was a decrease. These are real. So directionally, right, the relative number is real. The absolute number is the tricky thing. And so here as well, the relative number is what's important. And you can see dramatic increase week over week. Um, it's just going very crazy. It's that some people say it's on steroids. It's exactly what we saw in the Southern hemisphere as they went into their winter. Uh, and so I've talked about this previously. What we predicted is coming true. And this is just the beginning of our winter season. For many of the countries that we looked at uh, in the Southern hemisphere, um, it extend the, the, uh, their, their COVID SARS-CoV-2 season went through March and, and is continuing still in terms of the equivalent of their, of their March. So we can expect this for many more months. So, in, so here's Europe as a whole. This is the average. Here's Slovakia. Slovakia is one of the countries that's being worst hit. Um, and you can see per million, uh, it's roughly uh, 500 or so uh, cases per million per day. Um, and this is going to be an important number as a reference that we'll talk about later 
Um, so 500 cases per million per day is what Slovakia is, is seeing. And so as a result, this is out of control. Germany and France, uh, uh, they shut down when they had reached similar levels. And so, uh, and so Slovakia, they've had some restrictions, but they have not had a complete shutdown. And so the question is, well, should they have a complete shutdown or can they try to just get, uh, do other, other interventions without a full shutdown? And so what they've decided to do was um, do a uh, testing among all adults in the country, all adults. This, this is a massive undertaking. They're planning to do it over two weekends. Um, and so you can see this massive operation um, that they're trying, they're trying to use this to halt it. So then anyone that they identify as having a positive test will be required to stay home. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about sensitivity and specificity and the false positive rate uh, in, a little bit later tonight. But just to start, we can see that um, the tests tend to be very sensitive. And so if someone gets a positive test, then that's a good, even if it's a false positive, it's a good reason for them to just quarantine themselves for 10, 14 days or so. Um, but so what we're seeing here is that even though the country is trying to go in this direction, a lot of experts are very worried that, that uh, it's not gonna work based on the way that it's being done. Um, the concept itself, if it were managed better, might be okay. But the big problem is that um, the way that they're doing it is gonna be tough. They're going to, if by, by getting all of the people tested, the way that they're doing it so rapidly, a lot of people might increase their exposure to SARS-CoV-2 if they don't already have it. And it might actually increase the spread. The other thing is it's over a two week period. So some portion of people will get infected over that time that were negative and will now be positive. And so it's still gonna be problematic. Theoretically, you'd be able to capture a lot of the positive uh, infections at that point and be able to then to, to help it. The reason that they're doing this, and this is one thing, is that at the rate that they're going, so what the rate that I showed you, the rate that they're going, government ministers have said that the numbers are so alarming that unless they can control the spread, that unless the spread is slowed, the country's hospitals could be on the brink of collapse within weeks. And so it is out of control there. And so they need to do something. My bet, and so I don't, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but my bet is that they're gonna end up shutting down at some point um, because they, they, the, the, you, once you hit that point, this is what we saw back in March and April uh, in terms of the, the number of, of people hospitalized. If you breach the capacity of the hospitals, then you become like Italy where there's just not enough beds. Um, there was one country, I don't remember which country it was, um, but astonishingly, it was amazingly, astonishingly terrible um, because they didn't have enough beds for people with SARS-CoV-2. If someone who was 70 years old or older came in, for some of them, all they gave them was anti-anxiety medicine because they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough beds. So they figured, okay, well, let's just make it so you're not concerned about the virus. If the person's likely to die, then just let's send them home to die. And it's crazy, some of the stories that we heard in parts of the world. Um, and so now this is March, we were, we were lucky in some ways. March and April, were at the tail end of our typical cold and flu season. And then much of this exposure was occurring over the summer when it was the least contagious. This is our first true winter season that we're gonna have so SARS-CoV-2. So fall, winter, and, and early spring when, when SARS-CoV-2 is expected to be its worst. And, um, and it could hit really hard. And we're, that's why we're seeing the uptake across the world in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and so, yeah, so that's all I have for, for um, Slovakia. They're, they're testing, we'll see how it goes. Most likely um, it's, it's not gonna be as effective as they think, mostly because of logistics, uh, but, but it's out of control right now and, and it's, it, they're not gonna get the numbers down almost certainly to what they need just simply using the strategy alone. Oh goodness, something certainly we'll all keep our eye on and I'm sure you'll, you'll continue to keep us informed, that's for sure. So you spoke about testing and um, the different level of testing that we saw in the spring versus what we're seeing now, but could you dig in a little deeper, please? Folks wanna know about the false positive rate for tests and how we should interpret that. Um, so many tests seem to be producing a lot of false positives. And then on the converse, we've got do we have false negatives? Can you tell us 
what the world of testing has looked like and where we are now? Yeah, it's a really important question. There's so many different tests out there and they all have different sensitivity and specificity rates and all this. But before I get into this, let me use as an example a fresh off the presses new, new test that was just created. And this test is amazing. I think that this test has the potential to be revolutionary, frankly. And what's unique about this test <clears throat> is that it's a cough test. And so basically they used, uh, the researchers who did this, I believe they were at MIT, um, used artificial intelligence models to uh, detect whether someone had SARS-CoV-2 simply when they, by listening to their coughs. So the cough itself, to when the human ear hears coughs from someone who's not infected we ha versus someone who is infected, we can't tell a difference. If, so, if someone, if a doctor says to cough on command and you go, <coughs> no, people, most people can't tell any difference for, for uh, under normal situations. But so what the artificial intelligence model did is it looked at three different types of people and looked at their coughs looked at people who were not infected, truly not infected with SARS-CoV-2 and listened to their coughs. It listened to people who were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and were symptomatic. And it listened to people who were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and were asymptomatic. And it's so interesting. This is the, one of the most interesting things that I found. So originally they were doing this model to try to um, uh, diagnose Alzheimer's disease because apparently when people talk, there are slight variations in the vocal cord and breathing and other things that happen um, that an artificial intelligence model can, uh, can predict that the human ear can't detect because it's just too, too uh, small, the, the, the changes. But so they did it, they've, they've been continuing to look at it for Alzheimer's, but they said, what if we were to apply this to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2? And one of the most interesting things that I found in reading this article is that um, the sounds of talking and coughing are both influenced by the vocal cords and surrounding organs. So that means that when you talk, part of your talking is like coughing and vice versa. And it also means that when you have fluent speech, AI, so say you have a French dialect or you have a, a Spanish dialect or, or a native English speaker from, this, from the uh, South, the American South, the AI program can actually detect your native dialect, your native tongue in your cough. For me, that's fascinating. I never would have thought like, so Italians, which we sometimes think have a rhythm, Italians speak with a rhythm sometimes in the native language, you can detect that in the cough itself. It's fascinating. So uh, let me use this as an example. <clears throat> there were three basic components that the AI looked at. They looked at uh, vocal cords, uh, so in the cough, they were looking to, to see what the variation in the vocal cords caused on the, on the sound of the cough, on the lungs, so the breathing associated with the cough and the, and the window around the cough, and then the sentiment, which include, includes things like the native language of the, of the speaker and this kind of thing. Together, these were really interesting. It went together into this model, and that's how the model worked. Here is the, the results. Um, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but if you look down here, the personal assessment was whether the individual thought that they were positive or negative with SARS-CoV-2. The doctor assessment was whether the physician thought that they were. And then the official test, and that's, the, that's what we're looking at here, this cough test, the AI cough test. Um, this is what the cough test said. And so the key thing to look at over here, there's three key, key things. Among the positives, 89.5% of the individual people thought that they had it and they were right when they had it. Um, doctor assessment, 98.8, so almost perfect, and official test, 98.5. It was almost the same as the doctor. Um, the negative tests were very similar, but taken together, the total hit rate was highest for the official test, even slightly higher than doctors. I mean, if this is replicated and this actually works, then we could um, potentially just get an app for our, phone, for our uh, cell phones and then just cough into the cell phone app and it'll tell us with, with good diagnostic accuracy uh, whether we have SARS-CoV-2 and maybe asymptomatic even. So let's dig in. So this is a useful example for us to go back and revisit the question of, um, of the results of, of, of how uh, the diagnostic sensitivity and specificity of, these, of this test. 
So in this case, there's two things to look at. Um, among everyone, so whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic, the sensitivity was 98.5% and the specificity was 94.2%. And those sound really good. Typically for many tests, we assume that a set sensitivity and specificity over 90% is pretty good. And for most tests that are out there for SARS-CoV-2 right now, most of them meet that threshold. Typically for, met, for almost all diseases, you'd want two tests. The first one is what's called a screening test. And you'd want that to have as much sensitivity as possible. So that's, even if there's false positives, you don't care. The goal is to get every single possible positive uh, case or, or infection, you want them to be diagnosed. Then that's the screening test. The second test is the test that sort of is the confirmatory test. And so there you want the false positives to be, to be screened out. And so all you're left with are the true positives. And so for, for something like that, uh, where you'd want very high specificity, you wouldn't care about the sensitivity in that sense, the specificity would become more important. And so for instance, as a screener, um, an example might be breast cancer where you have a mammogram and you'd want the mammogram to be as sensitive as possible to, to screen in anyone who possibly has breast cancer. And then for the, the, the uh, diagnostic test after the screener, you do something like a biopsy, which you'd want to have a much higher rate of spe specificity so that if, there, if you truly are, uh, um, uh, truly do have breast cancer, then, then you identify and you, and you find it. So the same thing with SARS-CoV-2 in terms of these tests. Frequently, there's just not enough tests out there. So most people are only getting a single test unless they go into the hospital then there's more tests that are given and, and you have a, a wider variety of tests that are given. Um, and so, so that reduces the, the false positives when you're in the hospital. Um, but so here, let's use these examples of sensitivity and specificity. Let me revisit for just a moment these concepts. So now here was what, we look, what we're looking at. These are the test results. The, the test is either positive or negative. And here are the infections of whether you're truly uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 or not infected with SARS-CoV-2. So it's a true positive if someone has an infection and the positive test uh, and the positive test result. It's a false positive if they have a positive test result and no virus. And and down here, same thing. If the test is negative and they truly do have the infection, then it's a false negative. And if they don't have the virus and they do, and the test comes back negative, then it's a true negative. So here you can look, I, I took, have a, a, a cheat sheet over here. The sensitivity rate is the true positive divided by the total percentage of the people that actually have the infection. And so down here, the true, uh, the true uh, that, that's, the, that's the true positive, uh, that's the sensitivity rate rather. The true positive rate, um, uh, the true positives among all the actual infections. The true negatives among all the actual uninfected patients is called the specificity rate. And that's what we're looking at, the true negatives divided by the total uh, non-infected people. The positive predictive value is among all the positive test results, it's the percentage of all the positive test results that are truly positive. So then you could say, well, how likely, if you get a positive test result, how likely is it that you're actually truly infected? And the converse of this is the false positive rate. How, if you get a, te a positive test result, how, what's the false positive rate? And so that's related to the positive predictive value. Um, so let's apply this to our uh, new test, th this AI um, uh, cough test that I just described. <clears throat> so here are the results. The key, key thing that I want everyone to take away from this is that the sensitivity and the specificity are characteristics of the test itself. But the false positive rate actually varies a lot, almost entirely based on the prevalence, how common the, um, the infection is in the population. So for instance, let's say you have a population and there's an area where there's zero um, of SARS-CoV-2. So let's say it's a year ago, there was zero infection uh, in the United States. So in that case where there's zero, when you give the test to a thousand people, the test is still going to give you positive results, 
for a lot of people. They don't actually have SARS-CoV-2, but you have this false positive rate. And so because of the specificity is 83.2% in this, in this test, this is, this is when they're looking for asymptomatic people. So people with no symptoms, um, it has a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 83%. So that means if people are truly positive, it'll identify every single one of them. But then in addition, the specificity is less than 90%, it's 83.2. There's also gonna be get a lot of false positives that come out. But in fact, the false positive rate is 100% when there's 0% of the, of, uh, of the population uh, that is truly infected. If you were to jump, bring this up to say 50%, say half of the people were actually infected, then the, why isn't it calculating? Then the false positive rate drops to 14.4%. So there's a dramatic difference based on how prevalent something is. This is not intuitive for a lot of people to understand. This is epidemiology 101. A lot of students struggle with this, but I, I sometimes just playing around with this helps people to see. So again, if it's 0%, then all, because, because there's no true SARS-CoV-2, then all of it is false. Every single one of them is false. As you start getting higher numbers, then you get more true. So let's say you go up to 5%. Another way of saying this, let's look at, so let's keep it at 0% for a while. If you have 0% of the population that is truly infected, then 17% of the tests are going to come back positive. That's because that's we've given a thousand tests down here, 168 come back with a positive test result, 168 divided by 1000 is 17%. So 17% are still gonna come back positive in, in this case with this test that we're describing right here. So real, real numbers uh, in the situation where there was no SARS-CoV-2 at all. If SARS-CoV-2 uh, is actually present at a rate of 5% among the people who call in or, or give their cough test, then this comes there. Then this makes it so that 21% of the tests are coming back positive. So it's actually, so you still have a 76. So that another way of saying this is roughly three out of four tests that come back are positive. Only one out of four are truly, uh, are three out of four are false positives. Only one out of four are true positives. Still, this would be sufficient because only, so one out of five of the tests that are given are coming back positive. All, of all the tests that, all the 1,000 people that are tested, one out of five are coming back uh, as positive test results. Three out of four of them are gonna be false, but it's still very useful for people because it's a very simple test. And so this would be a reason to go and get an actual test. And then the actual test would be in a, a more of a comp confirmation and so then that would help you know, well, whether it was a false positive or a false negative when you're looking at it, or, or a true negative, or a false positive or a true positive, rather. Um, but so but the, re the fact that this is 100% sensitivity is what's most interesting. Um, and so I'll leave it at this. The, the one other thing I'll point out, just but there's a, a couple other points and then I'll move on, I'll make them quick. Um, let's use the case, not when we're looking just at asymptomatic patients, but when we're looking at the total population of people, regardless of whether they're asymptomatic or not. Um, and so let's look at that. So if we change the sensitivity to 98.5 and we change the specificity to 94.2, then, um, then you can see that this has a big impact on the false positive rate. Again, if I make this zero just for, for uh, an illustration, then you'll get 100% or false. But in this case, only 6% of the tests are test results of the thousand people you test are coming back uh, positive results. 100% of them would be false in this case. But say you bump it up to 5%, which we we're just at, then um, only half of them would be false positives. Um, and only 10% of the tests would come back uh, positive. And so this is a really, actually a really useful test because you wouldn't have to leave your home. You'd have inst almost instantaneous results. This, this could be really powerful. This could be game changing uh, if it's replicated and, and the uh, sensitivity and specificity that were defined in the paper turn out to be uh, consistent in real world conditions. But let me just, there's two more things I wanna say, or one more thing I wanna say about this. So the question is if the false positive rate is so low, 
when the numbers are really, uh, when the true prevalence is really low and the false positive rate is so high, how can we have any confidence at all when we're looking at real data in terms of diagnosed cases? And the reason that we do is that when you see the smallest number, so when in, in, in states around the country, when it's at the smallest number, if we were to assume that this is the false, that these were 100% were false positives at this number, then in this case, let's pick the date. This is June 26th when it reached its lowest number. So June 26th, there were 28 cases and 4,343 tests. That gives a false positive rate in real world conditions with the diagnostic tests that are being used. Uh, and this is North Dakota as an example, by the way, that we're looking at. It gives a false positive rate with these tests. This is not the AI test we were just talking about, the, the cough test. This is actual clinical tests that we're, we've been talking about with the PCR and whatnot. This gives a false positive rate of only 0.64%. Um, and so this is a very small false positive rate. And if we apply this false positive rate to the diagnostic tests conduct that were given on October 30th, so very recently, then, um, then you'll see that the, um, that the numbers, that the, it would have predicted 73 cases, but in reality, 1,400 cases were, were reported. And so clearly you can see that it's that the false positive rate has nothing uh, to, to do. It's really not driving these results at all in a meaningful way. All right, let's go back. I've been talking about this way too long, but we, we had a, a few questions come in about this false positive question uh, over the last week. So I really wanted to, to spend a little time digging into it. Well, I don't know about everybody else, but I was super impressed with that really neat interactive table. So bring it back at a future session. It's fun to see what happens when we play with the numbers, how you can have a real life impact. Very cool. Thank you, Glenn, for explaining the false positivity rate. Wow. Who knew so much went into epidemiology 101? Imagine 102. Oh, so that's, that's a single class in epidemiology 101. <laughs> Typically, you have a whole semester worth of classes in epidemiology 101. Well, Thank you. Thank you for giving us a crash course. <laughs> so a, a few people have asked about masks and um, SARS-CoV-2 can be an aerosol that's smaller than dust. So how can a mask help it all? And how can a, how is it possible? And, and Sandy, I'm going to ask you to unmute because Sandy has a question about internationally how we're, what we're seeing with mask wearing. Glenn, hi. Um, you know, you show that uh, the, the rates have spiked all over Europe and particularly Germany and France and now England is shutting down. I mean, so many places are shutting down. I'm just curious if they had mask mandates up until now. And if, if they did, would that be telling us that maybe it's not gonna, it really doesn't matter that if it's gonna go up, it's gonna go up and we're gonna have to have a, a shutdown also. It's a really, really good question. So I don't know the specifics of those countries, whether either if they had a mandate in all those countries or how just because you have a mandate in place doesn't mean that everyone is adhering to the mandate. And I don't know how many people were actually wearing masks. I can try to find out uh, for next week. But here's that I found that this uh, article really pulled a lot of these concepts together. El País is a major um, uh, newspaper uh, in Spain. And so they got hit pretty hard and they explained this really well. So let's dive into here. So in this case, they're looking at a situation where there's six people sitting in a living room. And so this one person is infected, this one person doesn't know that they're infected. And so the question is, you can see none of them are wearing masks. So how much does it spread? So we know that it's aerosolized. What we can see here is within four hours of just sitting within the room. Oh, you can't see very well. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not showing up on the, on the screen very well. But so within within four hours, um, what what you what what they find? Uh, no, it's not it's not showing up at all. All right, so I can just tell you. I was hoping it would it would show up in real life. Um, and so what they find is that within four hours, every single person in the room is infected. Oh wait, no, it's it's my screen that's not. Can you hear me? Yes, maybe it froze. Uh, Rebecca, can you tell me if you hear me? I can. I can hear you I, we see on the screen, the one individual that's red. Patient O. Glenn, are you frozen? 
He froze with a smile. <laughs> oh, he, uh, he went freeze with a smile. Good. All right, Glenn, you are frozen. I am going to text you that you are frozen. Stay tuned, everybody. All right, bear with us while we figure out this minor technical detail. Let's see, I'm sure he's logging out and logging right back in. All right, so uh, while we wait for Glenn, I will let you know some of the other questions that have come in that hopefully we'll have some time together tonight that we can talk about. So Glenn will be talking more about mask wearing and um, he'll also be talking about when you wear a mask, often it's quite difficult to breathe. So are there any studies that are being done to understand if mask wearing reduces the amount of oxygen that we absorb. And hopefully if there's time, we'll talk more about SARS-CoV-2 spreading amongst children. And it looks like Len is logging back in. There he is. Okay. Welcome back. We see Thank you. you. I had to reboot. You did that incredibly fast. So welcome back. So we were talking about masks and you were showing that us that diagram. All right, let me go back real quickly. All right, I was wondering why it wasn't uh, sharing. Okay, now I can see it. I was saying, why can't I see what I'm looking at on my screen? It's not updating. All right, so basically I'll go through this somewhat quickly. So if you have five people that are, uh, so total of six people in the room, this is a, a typical living room. This is one person that's infected, doesn't know it. Um, if they're in the room together for four hours, it's very, very likely that every single person will get infected in the room without wearing masks, okay? Let's say that you do wear a mask in the same conditions, four hours in the room, unventilated. It's just everyone sitting in this room. Um, everyone is wearing masks. It's very likely that four of the five people will still get infected. Only one will not. Masks are not a panacea, but they are helpful. And you'll see in other situations that we'll be about to look at that masks are more helpful the further when you still have more physical distancing and, and whatnot. This is, there's very, very little physical distancing here. But with aerosols, even the physical distancing doesn't matter. That's the key point here, um, is that the, it spreads through the air. The key things that we're looking at, there's I think three or four things that I wanna point out here. One, is that they're spending a lot of time together. The four hours is key because what we'll see is that it accumulates in the air. And so the longer that you spend time together indoors, the more at risk you become, okay? The, the other thing is the masks that you can see does have a protective effect, but it's not a panacea. It doesn't cure at all. And then the other thing is the ventilation. Right now there's no ventilation in here. So ventilation becomes critical. So if you increase ventilation, and you wear masks, then instead of just one person being prevented, now four of the five do not get infected. Only the one of the five gets infected. So the ventilation in some ways is even more important than the mask. And we're not talking about just like a fan that recirculates the, the air. We need true ventilation, like where the door is wide open, the windows are wide open. You put, you blast the heat so that it's still somewhat comfortable, but you need to have a flush, you, the air needs to be flushed constantly. It makes a big difference. Um, and, and so that's that. So that's what we were looking at there. Um, I'm gonna keep on going, there are a few others. This one is the interesting thing. What you see that's, that's interesting is there's a concentration effect. The longer you stay, stay within a, an enclosed area, the more it concentrates within that area. This becomes important because if we sh uh, start to shut down or if you have kids in the house that do get infected and we stay indoors now that the weather is getting cold, then what that means is that there's gonna be a concentration in the air. So we need to ensure that we have a lot of air circulation, even though the weather is cold, during the next three or four months, it's really gonna make a big difference if we try to get as much fresh air coming in during the course of the, of the season as we can. The other thing here um, is that you can see that when you're, if someone is just breathing silently versus talking versus singing or shouting, that makes a big difference in terms of how much aerosols are released. So this person who's talking, you can see each dot represents an infectious dose. 
over the course of one hour, this person who's talking, who's infected, could release as many as 1,500 infectious doses. And that's why we talk about these super spreader uh, uh, events, because it's so easy if someone's infected to infect many, many other people. I'll just give, give a couple other examples. Here's an example in a bar or an office building. And so this is an example, no one's wearing masks, no one, there's not very much ventilation and, and, so, and it's indoors. Um, you can see even in this situation, um, it's not, there's still a lot of empty uh, seats and stuff. Um, but, you'll, but you'll notice that as, uh, that, that the vast majority of people um, get infected under this situation, no masks. With the masks, around half of the people do not get infected. So masks are still very effective. I don't mean to say they're not, it's reduced it by half in terms of who gets infected. And among the other ones who may have gotten infected, it's likely that many of their symptoms will be less severe, but some of them could still get very severe symptoms, potentially fatal symptoms. So masks are not enough to protect you. But if in addition to the mask, you ventilate, then of all the people in the room, only a tiny fraction still get infected. The ventilation is critical. And also, again, again, the other thing here is the amount of time spent in the enclosed space together. <clears throat> and so the other thing, here's an example in a classroom. Classroom with 24 students. One of the unique things about an in-person classroom is that typically the teacher does most of the speaking. They talk loudly so everyone can hear. And if they're infected, then they can easily infect every, almost everyone else in the class here. You can see almost every, even if there's uh, not a lot of people, they're infecting much of the class. Even with masks, you can see some people still get infected. But so if you increase the ventilation, you still might have one infection or two. In this case, there's only one, but the vast majority of people don't get infected. So that's the key takeaway here that we're looking at. Masks are not a panacea. In fact, from the beginning, that was the whole reason that a lot of public health officials were uncomfortable even telling people to wear masks. And the reason was we knew that it wouldn't be perfect. We didn't know how effective it would be. I'm glad now that we're telling everyone to wear masks, but I'm also, it's also important that everyone knows on their own, they are not going to solve this. People can still get infected. The virus can become an aerosol. And so we need to do these other things. And so, and so that's that. Um, all right, let's go back to you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. These demonstrations you've been giving are really, really helpful. So let's talk more about the mask. Um, sometimes anyone feel it's a little hard to breathe when wearing a mask. And if you wear glasses, you told me, be careful if my glasses are fogging up, that means I'm not wearing the mask the right way. But have any studies been done to show if wearing a mask reduces the amount of oxygen we absorb? Do we, do we even know anything about this? Yeah, so that is an interesting question. All right, let me share my screen here. Um, so there was a meme or, or on social media, a lot of people are complaining. They don't like wearing the mask because it makes it hard to breathe and they're afraid they're not getting enough oxygen. So some folks actually did a study looking to see if it actually impacts the amount of oxygen that we're getting. And the quick answer here is, no, it has no impact on the amount of oxygen. Um, the results are pretty conclusive. Um, they do not support the claims that wearing non-medical face masks uh, in community settings is unsafe. It's completely safe. When you look at the results, they were essentially identical uh, in terms of the results of what, what people are going. I'm not going to go into the details very much here. But yes, a study was done. Um, it's confirmatory. Uh, where oxygen is a molecule that's extremely, extremely small. It has no problem getting in and out of the mask. And so um, uh, if people have a, a trouble uh, breathing, then they could try a mask that has maybe a little bit more space in between the fabric and the, the, their face. But other than that, there's no worry about not getting enough oxygen. All right, back to you, Rebecca. Well, that's good to know. So just another public service announcement. Can you see, I remember back early on, you told us to get one of these, a pulse oximeter. Did I say it right? That's right. Okay, so if you haven't yet gotten one, you know where to get one. <laughs> I'm not gonna promote any particular stores or organizations that might deliver the next day, but pulse oximeter, 
you want to know your oxygen level, make sure you get one. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. Well, it's a, the biggest reason that's important is because some people have SARS-CoV-2 infection, particularly people who are older and might not be in the best shape. And they might not, the first indication if they're not getting a test that they have SARS-CoV-2 might be that they do the test with the pulse oximeter and their oxygen is lower than they expected. And so it's really important that some people, if they have no other way of knowing at home, particularly over the next few months, if they test themselves daily, they should have pretty consistent results in terms of the amount of blood oxygen level, which would be above 95%. If it falls below then consistently when they try it, then it means that they should call the physician and see if it about getting an actual SARS-CoV-2 uh, test. And so this is an important and an easy way for people who might be at high risk to test themselves regularly and give them the confidence uh, if the oxygen levels are high that they might, that they're, that it's, that at least they don't have to worry about that portion of it. Excellent. Okay, so I think something's happening this week. I think Tuesday is kind of a big day for our country. And I see you brought this up. Um, with the election on Tuesday, what do outbreaks across the country look like, particularly in swing states? Yeah, so I figure regardless of what people, what side people are on with the election, this is something that is capturing the minds of virtually every American. And frankly, people around the world are looking at this American election right now. So I thought it would be interesting to look at the swing states. And in, in the United States, we have these swing states because of our electoral college that each state actually has a certain number of electors. And those are the ones that actually vote for the president, It's not truly a popular vote. Um, and so there's a few states or a handful, let's say 10 or so, uh, give or take. Uh, there's only nine in this picture, there's more in this one. Um, that that shut that really determine the election because the other states are either much more likely to vote for Trump or much more likely to vote for Biden. Um, before I jump, so these are the states. Uh, we'll get into the details in just a second. But I, before I jump in, I just wanted to show you. Um, well, so on this first, this is the order in which they're likely to have an effect. Pennsylvania is most likely to be the determining state. Then Florida. Then Arizona then North Carolina, then Michigan, then Wisconsin. It gets smaller and smaller from there. Uh, and these all have a smaller chance of being uh, affected or, or being the, the state that makes the difference in the election. So before I jump in, um, at a global level, here are the current daily new confirmed cases per million people. So Europe that we were talking about that's getting hit so hard right now is at 320 per case, new cases per day per million people. United States, we're at 237 is our average. Um, the, the world average, including Asia, which is doing really well right now in Africa, the world average is only 61 cases per million people. Um, so, but let's look at 237. This is the reference point of where we are in the United States. This is the average across all the states. So let's use that as we look at the swing states, 237.2. Uh, and I'll, put, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. When we look at the map, I said earlier that most of the infections right now that are surging are mostly occurring right here. We are seeing an uptick throughout the country, but the highest levels right now, the where it's already hit a certain level is, is sort of like right in this area of the country. So some of the swing states are in this area, some are not. But you can see, so let, well, as we dig in, you'll see that the numbers. One, one thing I want to draw your attention to, because I think this is the last time I'll, I'll bring this up tonight, um, so Europe, you see right now they're getting hit so hard, their, their rough average is around 320. I want you to see in the United States, North Dakota's number. We're at 1,880 cases per million people. That's, we're in a whole different ball game than Europe and much of the rest of the world. If, our, if many of our states were their own countries, we'd be astonishingly in bad shape right now. The average, when you compare states like Maine or New Hampshire that really aren't doing as poorly, uh, it brings the average down. Uh, but many of our states are really not doing well. So let's dig into some of these. Interestingly, so I put these orange circles around. This, these are this, the week in which states had their peak so far. What their peak number of new cases, the single day record cases for each state. And you see that approximately half of the swing states so far um, had had their peaks in the last two weeks uh, so far. Again, I say that the, the peaks are gonna continue to go up in a lot of states, 
but at least in the last two weeks, around half of the swing states have hit their have had their peak. Um, let's just jump into some of the specifics. I won't spend too much more time on this, but I'll spend the, uh, a little time on the on the ones that are most likely to impact the election. So Pennsylvania, you see that they had a first surge earlier in the year. They never got it under control. Now they're surging again, but it's somewhat early in the surge. Their rates of hospitalization early were a lot lower, but now they're, rad they're, they're very quickly starting to rise, but it's still right at the beginning. So right now they haven't seen a lot of new deaths as a result. When you look at the total number of cases per million, uh, when you estimate it here, you see that they're right around the total number that they had. You can see it up on this graph and you can also see it up over here. They're right around 215. Right again, just to remind you, 237 is the US average, 215 is what Pennsylvania is looking at. So they're a little bit below average. So it's unlikely to be truly representative of, or, or truly impactful in terms of the voting that goes on in Pennsylvania. However, because it's rising so rapidly, it might be making the news and people might be aware of it. Um, next, in terms of Florida, Florida got hit really hard over the summer for the US. Uh, and then the surge went down. They never got it fully back under control. It's starting to rise again. But again, the same situation as Pennsylvania. It's really just at the beginning of the rise. You see at the beginning, the hospitalizations have barely begun to just start to rise again. The deaths have not been impacted yet. You can see over here, they really went, when you look at this per million, um, they really had most of their impact uh, earlier in the year. It's just barely starting to rise again, but it's probably not going to have a big impact on this election um, in terms of the infection itself. In contrast, Wisconsin uh, was spared for most of the year previous to this and is now starting to really get big. And you can see the hospitalization rate is jumping, the death rate is jumping, and the cases per million. Again, in the United States, the average is 237. We're looking at 1,360 here, roughly. Um, all right, next. Here, we're looking at Minnesota. Minnesota um, got through most of the year again um, not, it was uh, not, they didn't really have a major surge earlier, but it wasn't under control for much of the year. Now they're truly surging. It's really getting out of control. The hospital rates are going crazy. They're still just, look at the, the slope. It's just going straight up practically. Um, and the death rate is starting to climb very quickly as well. Um, you can see when you, when you normalize this and look per million, um, they're at the peak right now. So it's only going to get worse. The average is 237. They're at 539. Minnesota, SARS-CoV-2 is probably going to have an impact uh, in terms of just the dynamics of getting out to vote. It's on the top of mind there. It could, it could be impactful. Um, Michigan, so, uh, so we just looked at Minnesota. Michigan is, is in a similar uh, situation. They're surging now in terms of the number of cases. Their hospitalization rates haven't quite jumped up yet to what we just saw previously, but you see that it's rising so rapidly, the hospitalization numbers are gonna start to jump uh, as well. And the death rate has slowly started to come up, but even that has not risen a lot. When you look at it from a normalized perspective, again, the average is 237, 501. We see these big numbers that it's just beginning there. Um, SARS-CoV-2 could be in impactful for that state. Arizona, if you recall, they got hit really hard earlier in the year, back in the summer. Um, then they got it mostly under control, but not all the way but now it's starting to surge again. And it's right at the beginning of their surge. And so the hospitalization rates have just started to go up. The death rates haven't been impacted yet. So for Arizona, it's not likely to impact them uh, at that state at the same level as some of the other states that we saw. North Carolina, you can see that they uh, had a surge. They never got it back under control. And then it's going back up again. Uh, the death rate is continuing to go up. You see that there was a little peak back in July, August, then it was started to go down. Now it's going back up again. This They had this one outlier, 586. It's a little bit closer to 200. It's right, it's just slightly above the US average if you look at this number over here. So um, North Carolina, it could be impactful, um, but it's unclear just when you look at the hospitalizations and whatnot. Um, Nevada, and I'll just go through a few more just because they're, um, they're interesting. And there's so many people that are curious about what's going on in these states that I'll just put it up here just so people see. I won't spend more, much more time talking about it. Nevada is going through a very clear second surge. Hospitalization rates are just starting to go up, but they will go up more, but it won't really hit until after the election. Um, whoops, uh, it's until after the election. Oh, it sounds like I was frozen for a little bit. How much did I miss, Rebecca? No, you're, you're good. I'm good? Okay, good. So the hospitalization rates are continuing to go up um, and the, the death rate, but, but it's, it's not really going, uh, going as quickly as the cases were. 
and the daily deaths are, are not really going up yet. Uh, they will as the hospitalization rates start to go up and whatnot. You can see when it's normalized, uh, the second surge is, a clear, is clearly happening. People might have had earlier memories of that first surge, and now that the second surge is happening, uh, it might impact their voting again in terms of their going out to the polls and, and what they think what's on top of mind as they go and make their voting. Um, Ohio, Ohio is clearly surging right now. The hospitalization clearly surging um, and the death rate is, hasn't, uh, it's because the surge is just starting, we're really not seeing the death rate spiking yet. It will, but it's not really there yet. So I don't know what the impact will be in terms of uh, the people. You can see the average for the US 237, the, uh, what we're looking at Ohio is 329, so it's slightly above average that we're looking at, but there's a clear peak. It's going to be on some people's minds. I don't know if, how strong the impact is going to be in terms of the election. Colorado, massive peak that we're looking at in new cases that we're seeing. Hospitalization rate is happening very quick, but it's right at the beginning of what was, it, we're expecting to be a major wave. So we haven't really seen the death rate change very much. Normalized, they're at around 419. It's just gonna to continue to rise. You see that it's above average, but I don't know if it's enough. It hasn't impacted the death, death rate yet. Um, here we're looking at Virginia. Virginia got hit hard a couple times. They really truly had a first surge, then a second surge, got it slightly back under control, but now they're starting, this uh, third surge is start, just barely starting to go up again. Hasn't really impacted the death rates, but they've had deaths throughout the year. And so there's a, it's, they've been thinking about SARS-CoV-2 uh, over, the, over the last year because they've been hit. Texas, another key state that people are looking at, they had the clear first surge over the summer, never got it under control. The second surge has started, but it's just begun. It's just barely begun. So the hospitalization rates have just barely started to go up and the, um, the death rates now are, um, are not really going up very high yet, but they will, but not yet. Normalized rates, you see it's right around the US average. Um, just a couple more here, just two more, Georgia, um, is also on the list here. Um, Georgia had their first surge, their first big surge back in um, the summer. Then it went down. They never got under control. The second surge has started. Um, we're, start to, we're starting to see some change in the hospitalization rates, but it's very early. Um, the death rates really haven't started to go back up again. So I don't know for Georgia if it's really going to have a big impact. Finally, uh, for New Hampshire, again, surge, it's starting to surge like crazy in New Hampshire. The hospitalization rates have started to go up. The death rates haven't really been impacted. It's right at the beginning. So I don't know if it's gonna have a big impact there. Um, and you see, even with the surge that's happening, they're below the US average. So I, I don't know what the, what the impact will be in terms of people's uh, uh, decision while they're voting or whatnot. I do know that Fauci over the last few days has, like I said earlier, has really clarified that the current administration has failed uh, with SARS-CoV-2. This is just the view of mainstream epidemiologists that are out there. We, I mean, when you compare where we are to the rest of the world, um, we're really, uh, over the last, uh, since March, over the period since March and, and February, we haven't done well. When you look at the total cumulative uh, number of deaths and, and, and people who've gotten sick, and, and many people who still have lingering symptoms to this day, who got infected months and months ago, um, we, we have failed. And so, um, we, we need a radically different approach to the public health uh, uh, management of this, of this outbreak in the United States. Um, so that's it. I don't know, unless there's any other questions specifically about um, this question about the election in SARS-CoV-2, um, I'll give it back to you, Rebecca. It looks like we're almost at uh, Yeah, I think we have a lot of questions and I think we'll have a lot of answers, hopefully that will come out <laughs> this week, but um, Thank you for clarifying that sort of on, on this, the COVID-19 front, and um, certainly it will be an interesting week. So again, you've given us lots and lots of great data. Some of this is, is difficult to handle. It's really exciting to hear about the work that's being, on the art of, being done on the artificial intelligence front, and hopefully you'll tell us more about that soon and we can all along with others, download that app. Hopefully it'll be available very soon. That is really, really exciting. And um, thank you again for taking your time and, and sharing your knowledge with us and being our tour guide through this whole experience. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate being with you every week. I know lots of other people do too, live and on YouTube. And um, if you have questions, please send them in to Glenn during the week or to me, I'll get them to Glenn. 
And we like to make this as interactive as possible. And um, Glenn likes to prepare as much as he can in advance. So with that, Glenn, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. And in particular, you, Rebecca, you've been so great. Thank you so much all of these weeks serving as moderator. It's been a true delight. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure, truly my pleasure. So everybody be safe, be well, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you, Glenn. Good night. Thanks. Have a great week. Bye-bye.